Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Madonna Rosario, and I work at UNC Charlotte. Um, and we are really excited um, to be here presenting for you today. Um, we are a duo, dynamic duo, right? Um, Trey was my grad assistant last year at Charlotte, and we created this presentation in the hopes of um, bringing some more mindfulness to the education that happens with our trans students and gender nonconforming students. If you're not part of a university, this will still apply to you, um, for sure. So. Um, I hope that you'll be able to take away some good information today. Um, we're both pretty informal presenters. If you have a question at any point, please raise your hand and we'll stop pre periodically to take some questions as well. Um, we're gonna have some fun. Um, we're all, how many of us are higher ed professionals? Oh, good. Okay, so the rest of you, welcome to higher ed. Um, everything has to be interactive, otherwise the students don't learn as well, apparently. So we are going to be doing a lot of that stuff. So hopefully it will bring us a little bit, all of us out of our comfort zone a little bit. Um, I want this to be a safe space. Um, so there is no wrong or right way. We're just going to have conversations that are open and um, there will be no judgment. Um, that way, once we finish up with this presentation, everybody will feel a little bit more comfortable with what they've learned and hopefully be able to translate it to their own work and wherever you're going to be going home to tomorrow. So um, I will let Trey do his own introduction. So, um, my name is Trey Green. I'm the executive director of Transcend Charlotte. I'm a trans man and a survivor. So it was really important for me. I'm really passionate about the work of bringing trauma-informed care to the transgender community. We work out of um, Charlotte, North Carolina and we have services for adults in the community. Um, and sexual assault is one of my primary interests in, in, because the, the statistics are so high in this population. So this was, the presentation is really important to me to, to get the word out that, um, that this stuff is happening and it's happening at very high rates in this population. So we're gonna start with Start with the basics, so I'm sorry if it's a little basic for some of you in the room, but it's a good refresher and reminder as well. Um, so I'm gonna let Trey take this on. Go ahead. So I'm sure most of you know LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Is anybody in the room not know LGBT? <laughs> okay, good. Sometimes they don't. Yeah, <laughs> we've had it happen. <laughs> so, um, so transgender, is basically means that you're sex assigned at birth, which is what's on your documents, on your birth certificate, on your driver's license legal documents when you're born. Um, that's what the doctor assigned you, but it's not necessarily how you identify. So somebody that's transgender, their gender identity is different from what they were assigned at birth. So like for me, I was assigned female at birth, and I now identify as a male and have changed on my documentation to say male. And we also wanted to point out like cisgender is a really important word to use because a lot of times, times people used to say that um, they would compare transgender people to like a real, like these people are real men and real women and then these people are trans men. So we don't want to say that they're not real. We don't want to say that they're not biological. They're, it's cisgender and transgender. They're, both of their experiences are equally valid and equally real and biologically valid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cisgender is basically anybody that's not transgender. It means that the sex you were assigned at birth describes who you are. So the acronym is, is it an acronym? Is it a S I S? I don't, it's not an acronym, I don't think. C I S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. C I S. It's from Latin. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, you are, if you are identified female at birth, you, uh, you identify as a female, or you identified male at birth, you identify as a male. You all should have the gender unicorn handout. And we, I gave it to you only um, for two reasons. One, so you could take it with you and use it, um, because this is something that we love to use when we educate. Um, but also because it's small here, and you probably won't be able to see it well. So now you can actually hold it in front of you and, and kind of follow along as Trey and I go through it a little bit. So a, a lot of you have like seen the LGBTQIAP, and it seems like there's always different letters being added on to it. And it's, it's really hard to keep up with everything. So um, you see this acronym at the top is actually the longest one that we have. 
that is all of the letters, and some of them stand for more than one thing. So it's, it's a lot. And so queer, undecided, intersex, lesbian, trans, um, bisexual, asexual, gay, pansexual, indeterminate, polyamorous, and then it goes on. Um, so the point in the gender unicorn is that all these letters are just ways to describe people where they are on these spectrums. So gender identity, how you feel up here, gender identity is in your head. Your gender expression is how you express that. So somebody can, and your expression doesn't have to match your identity. So you could identify as male and you could express, you could wear dresses, you could wear makeup and things that are typically identified as female. That's your gender expression. Those are your behaviors, clothing, speech, anything that expresses your gender. Sex assigned at birth is simply that on your legal documents and then who you're sexually attracted to is a separate, is a separate thing. Connected, but it's a separate issue. As you're talking about gender versus who you're attracted to, who you are versus who you're attracted to. Any questions about that before we move on? It'll be important as we progress and talk more about the relationship dynamics. Um, so you can always bring it back up and you have it to kind of refer back to as well. And I always like to say that anybody can use this, like it's not just for LGBT people because you have people that are, are cisgender who, especially with women, we see it more with women, that some of them are more like a tomboy, what we call a tomboy, it's more accepted to be a tomboy. Um, so you may be very feminine and wear makeup and you're kind of on the expression, you'll be more feminine or more masculine. It's not as acceptable on the male side, but we see that same thing. Males sometimes express very feminine or very masculine. So the expression, these are things that you can all look at and say, yes. Our um, Multicultural Resource Center is mostly in charge of the safe zone trainings. Um, and this is what they use and they've vetted. So I just kind of, I've taken it on as something that is, um, something that's taught in multiple places on campus. Um, and I, our students mostly have never seen anything like it, so they don't ask me about that. <laughs> but <laughs> now I'll have to think of an answer for them when they ask me. <laughs> um, but, and, and so we, we, we go along, we like to have clear, consistent messaging throughout all of our departments that do any piece of this work. Um, so if they were to change their graphic, then I would probably change ours too, just to make sure it would match. Um, but, we, a big part of this training is also about oppression and privilege, so we do address it, but not directly about the graphic. Um, we also caution people that this is not an end-all be-all. Right. Um, it's, it's probably meant more as the tool for the students that have never been exposed to the idea of somebody that could be in their class that could be transgender or relate to any of it. Um, and so it's a good first step. Um, and then the next step is the, the second piece of education, if I can ever get back in front of that same audience again, which, you know, is hard sometimes. But thank you. Yeah, and I really think it's just the best that we have now, and things are always developing and changing, and there may be something better that comes out, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest thing from this is to have people be able to look at it and say there are those, especially the three aspects that we're talking about today, the gender identity and gender expression and sexual orientation, that they're separate. So we're going to do an uh, assignment, and I'm going to hand out um, little slips of paper that have a few different sort of scenarios on them. Um, and this is specifically um, to get us started to think about what our privileges are related to our gender. Um, so we may have done other privilege exercises in different workshops. Um, this is a little bit unique. Um, so I want you to kind of keep in check in your mind about how it makes you feel to, to read the statement out loud to the person that you're going to pair up with. Um, how it makes you feel that somebody even has to think about that, um, what's surprising about that statement that you're going to get. So on the back of your unicorn, there's a pronoun chart. Um, again, this might be basic for some people, but I wanted to, um, everybody signed into the conference and may have their own sticker. Um, and I really feel like I was really excited to see that because I think um, a long time, I mean, not even that much long, not that long ago, it would never have happened. So um, sometimes we come into places and they, this is the most confusing thing um, with our audience today that might not be so, but um, I definitely want to have Trey kind of go over a little bit of this for you so that we can highlight some of it. And that way you can kind of follow along and see it because I'm sure you can't see that graphic up there. Yeah, so... Um so people will come in and everybody like understands pronouns. We have to go back to elementary school. Sometimes people are like, what's a pronoun? <laughs> so like he, she, her, he, him, his, 
The main ones that we hear like at Transcend, we've we've served about 200 people over the last year, and we've always it's been he, she, or they. Um, but you will have people come in that sometimes use these other ones like Z and Zier and um, Z and here. Like so, the main thing to remember is when you're talking to somebody about their pronouns, like they'll tell you what they want to use, and if it's something you haven't heard before, then just have them teach you how to how to do that. And with they and them, some people kind of argue that that's plural, but we don't really have a singular neutral in English. So, And we already use they. Like if, if you think if somebody's coming in the room and, and we don't know the gender of that person, you're like, yeah, we're saving a chair for them, like whoever that, that is. We already use that for people when we don't know their gender. So some people who are non-binary, who don't identify as one or the other, will use um, they, them, because that's more in line with who they are. And on my intake form, I have preferred pronoun and preferred name. I don't have to abide by some big system. I could make it up as I go, which is nice. Um, so I do have the flexibility to do that. But I do find that it's very helpful when people have options. Um, so again, it's just, and then make sure you read it, right? Before, sometimes on a busy day, it's, diff it's very easy to get lost in that. And then all of a sudden you have your client in front of you and you're like, I don't even know what's going on with this person. So I also try to make sure to go back and review um, and, and then before I see them again. Um, sometimes I don't see people more than once or twice, but um, it's important to make sure that I don't forget or that I know who I'm talking to every time I'm with them. Um, because just that little gesture is, goes a really long way, especially when you're talking about relationship violence and, and sexual assault treatment or um, advocacy. You want to help them make, make them feel as safe as possible. Yeah, and I always um, say to use, like, use them whenever you can. Have them like, in your email signature. When you introduce yourself, kind of get used to introducing yourself with your pronouns, saying, my name is Trey, my pronouns are him and his. And people will often like, like why are you telling me this? They're like, well, some people don't go by the pronouns that that they that people expect them to go by so I just want to make sure that I'm referring to you in the right way and that's all you have to say and it can be an educational moment or that can be the the end of the conversation but it's a good thing to get people kind of thinking that we can start treating people more respectfully and kind of letting people choose where they fall and and letting them be who they are so as you can see we got we we borrow a lot because um, this is really good stuff, and we, we had thought about making it ourselves, but um, the transstudent.org has fantastic information and graphics. Forge is another place that we get a lot of information, and if you haven't been to one of their workshops yet this week, um, try and go, because they do some amazing work. Um, so we, we try to kind of piggyback off, again, a clear, consistent message, um, even if it's nationwide versus organization-wide, um, to make sure that we're all on the same page um, and teaching something that's at least similar so that everybody understands that this is the way, right? Any questions about pronouns before we move on? Good. Okay. So we're going to go over just some stats. Um, you may know this, but, um, and this is from Forge. If you were in his workshop, M Michael's workshop yesterday, you saw this, but. Um, so we know that it's a very high statistic, and, and one, of the one of the things that we do know also, as we've discussed here, is our forms are all different, we're tracking things differently, so it's also very difficult to pinpoint an exact number, um, but 50 to 66 percent have experienced sexual assault, and we know that, um, and it's probably higher than that. Um, much like other sexual assault statistics are probably higher, um, it's probably safe to guess that. But knowing that, even if your work isn't 100% about trauma all the time, and you do have a client that's coming for housing or um, clothing needs or food needs, um, I don't want to ever make assumptions, but the statistics are very, very high, and we don't know um, what they might be going home to or why they might be in that predicament, um, especially when they identify on the binary or trans. And so it's important, again, to make sure that we ask the right questions. Um, I remember going to the ER for like a sprained ankle and being asked if I was safe at home and um, little things like that make a big difference or just your signage, right? Have a trans flag or some sort of a, um, you can write to Forge and get free pamphlets for your waiting room. Um, just having that in there mixed along with all the other stuff that might be more heteronormative is gonna be very helpful. So we're gonna focus a little bit more on the IPV aspect um, because we are, one thing that we talked about when we were working together last year was 
my education, and Trey helped an enormous amount with um, helping to revamp some of that. So um, we're going to talk about how we reconstructed it with the help of some of these other organizations in the country that are already doing this. Um, because the dynamics in these relationships are very different. And so, again, those statistics that are on the chart probably are a little bit higher um, because some people may be going through different types of abuse in their relationship and not document it that way in their minds even, right? So we're going to start with a refresher. Hopefully it's a refresher. Everybody's familiar with Maslow's hierarchy from, now, now bring back your education, like bring back like your masters, right? Um, I like to read this every now and then to remind myself when I'm doing crisis work with survivors what my priority needs to be and where I need to help them focus, um, especially when we're talking about our transgender clients. Um, many of them don't even have a place to live. And, and, and in Charlotte and North Carolina in general, um, first of all, there's laws against where they can live right now, right? But um, there's not any transitional housing or safe spaces. Um, a lot of our shelters are very much in, on the gender, like male or female, and that's it, and nothing in between, and um, they don't even know what to do with somebody who might not fit that norm. So it's gonna be difficult to meet some of these needs, but this is where we need to be with them. Um, it's not necessarily about connecting them to a support group to meet friends, um, because we want them to be safe first, right? And that's really, really difficult. You wanna add? Yeah, and um, like, and coming to it from the framework that kind of knowing that trans people kind of become homeless, the average age I think is 13 that they become homeless. So you're having people who are, are having this chronic homelessness. And I know in Charlotte, I've had several clients come to me, trans women especially, who are often sent to the men's shelter or, and that's where their sexual assault occurred. And so these people are often like staying on the streets because there's, there's nowhere safe for them to go. It's actually safer for them to stay under a bridge than to go to some of the places that agencies are sending them and the unemployment rates and just, just, just layers and layers of things that kind of compound upon each other. And many times our services for domestic violence and sexual assault have a woman in the title even. So how would that apply to me if I don't identify as that? Um, I've even had her heterosexual male clients who were assaulted or who are stalking victims and called some of these services in our city and be told, well, that's a conflict of interest. I don't know if that means that their perpetrator is a client there. Like, I don't know what that means, but I do know that then I don't know what to do with them because there's nowhere else for them to go. And th that's just for court advocacy. That's not even for shelter. Um, I don't even dare ask them for shelter for my men. Um, but a trans man is not gonna be able to be accepted there either. Um, and that is a huge challenge. And so they stay in these relationships much longer than necessary, right? Yeah, I noticed that that for me because I'm, I mean, I lived 28 years as a woman and then like coming into this work and going into work into the DV shelter and suddenly I don't feel welcome there. And I know there's no options for men. So I'm like, as, as a survivor, I'm like, if I'm, if I'm trans or if I'm cisgender and I'm male, where do I go? If I'm a trans woman, where am I going to go? Because there's, there's this very strong energy of this is a female space and, and we don't, for trans women, we don't really see you as female. And then for me, people are just confused because they don't want to put me anywhere, but. <laughs> so so we, we keep this in mind, but we also keep in mind the fact that there are extreme challenges to helping them meet those needs in, our, in all of our communities. I don't think that even the most progressive of our communities is doing this right yet. Um, even in a city like New York City, where I used to work, we had a youth shelter for LGBT. BT identified students, but it was most, mostly LGB students, and I think there were like 12 beds, and it only went up to the age of 24, um, which wasn't ac actually very helpful. Um, it was great that it existed, um, however, it, it was not very helpful in a city where the homelessness of, the, of our youth, I mean, it's just huge, um, which then leads to all these other risk factors that can make them very vulnerable to violence, right? And I think a lot of the services that are LGBT focused don't really have the trauma informed experience. So when you have people coming in with all these complex issues, they might have housing options for LGBT people, but you have to meet all these criteria that, and they're like, oh, you have, there's too much mental illness or there's too much this, there's too much that, and you don't meet the criteria to get housing there. So it's really hard to find a space that kind of understands both things. And for trans people, both things are often an issue. 
Yeah, we, we often see the, the chronic suicidality comes into play as a huge barrier to housing. It may get them in the hospital if they disclose too much, right? But that's always not always all, a great place to be either because where are they going to be in the, in the hospital? What, what room are you going to be in? Are you, you know, are you, if you're a trans woman, are you going to be with other women? Or where will you be housed there as well? Um, what kind of treatment are you going to get? Are you going to have a psychiatrist who understands or are you going to have a psychiatrist who is still, back in the day, diagnosing you because you identify that way? So um, it's great that we can get treatment for our, some of our clients, but we also have to properly screen that treatment and make sure it's going to be safe for them as well. So these are some of the gaps in services that I'm sure you all have identified as well. Um, and um, our, certainly our crisis shelters, our evidence collection, going to the hospital, like you said, um, for any emergency, whether it's breaking a toe or sexual assault or reporting IPV um, and coming in with batters being very battered. Um, how, do they, how do they access that? Do they even want to? What happens if they don't? Um, certainly our long-term housing, medical care. Uh, there's a lot of underinsured and uninsured um, individuals in the community. And there's a lot of discomfort, I think, um, if you're talking about evidence collection, talking about medical care, when somebody that comes in, I've had several clients that come in and, and maybe they haven't, they don't pass as female, because a lot of times I think that's the issue, it's passing. People who come in that are lower socioeconomic status don't have the fifty dollars to $100,000 it costs to pass, and then they come into these facilities and it's like, oh, this is a man in a dress, mm -hmm. and then we're like, what are we going to do with him? And we're coming at it from that framework. So um, I think I've had clients who come into like the ER and the same thing happens with cisgender men. Sometimes they don't want to do the rape kit. Sometimes it's, sometimes they, they don't know what to do with it. They're like, oh, you're not female. Like there's just a lot of hesitation with that. And then you have somebody that's trans that's coming in that has to them looks like a guy that's dressing very feminine and they're just confused and they're uncomfortable and they don't know how to handle it. So they kind of try to push that person to the side and like, we don't know how to deal with this, so we're just not going to. So a lot of, there's a lot of services that don't have the education to do that. And I think, um, and I, I, Michael had said this in his presentation for Forge, they were talking about in medical settings, it was one in 10 have experienced a sexual assault in a medical setting. So a lot of these things are happening and why, why is a person gonna seek help? Why is a person gonna go to the doctor? Um, especially if you're talking about somebody after a sexual assault, we know how, how low the statistic is anyway for people reporting who aren't trans. So you add in being trans and all these negative experiences already, how many pe of those people are reporting and going to the doctor? So that stat is probably much higher and people are getting help is much lower. And how are we training our advocates? Um, a lot of states have 40 hours and then you're kind of set free, right? I mean, I spend a lot of time in school. I've done this for 15 years and I still need training, right? And so you have one what, 12-hour shift a month maybe, or, you know, what? It, and we love our volunteers. I loved mine when I worked with my volunteers. But how are they being educated? Is it an hour out of that 40 hours that they're trying to un cram in pronouns and trauma-informed care for someone that they may not, they may get one client that identifies as trans in, in one year, and, we, and they're their advocate, right? So it's all about also rethinking the whole process of how they enter our systems, whatever our system looks like not just from forms, but starting with forms for sure, but then all the way up to training. If someone were to call the hotline, like I did recently, like I was scared to use a different pronoun. I mean, I, that they, I would have to like go through this whole explanation before I could actually get my answer. Um, and, and so how, how do I know that you're being trained? You know, that's about how you present yourself on a website, right? How do you, how, what's your literature look like? Um, how do you make the space for all if you are my sister's place or whatever, right? Um, and it's not impossible, but it takes a lot of strategic thought and thinking and research, I think. And that's the, that's the hesitation I've heard a lot when I'm trying to train people on this. It's like, well, there's not that many trans people. We haven't really had seen them come in. It's, it's that they're not coming to you. It's not that they're not there. Um, like, just talking about transcend in general, we've, we've only been in existence a little bit over a year, and had we've had 200 people like show up to our support group. We didn't plan for it to be that way. People just started kind of pouring out of the city like this is, we need help, We've, we don't have anywhere to go. So if you open your doors to those people, that they will come. It's just that they're out in the community and they don't feel safe coming to you. So kind of how can we reach out to that community? How can we show that we're safe? If you present your, yourself in any of these aspects as safe, you will see an increase in your clients. You will. Um, but then you also need to make sure that you're not the only one who's the holder of that information, right? 
you're not the only one who understands how to create the forms or how to address in pronouns or has this knowledge. So it's about bringing whatever your local resources are that do this work into your staff meetings, um, into day-long trainings or half-day training or whatever. Um, watch the webinars on Forge. I think he said there's like 50 or 55 of them. Um, get Download those manuals, print them out for your staff. Like That's how we do this, right? And, and that's how we can meet some of this need. Um, at least at our organization's level. And then the next piece is being advocates like we're supposed to be, right? And partnering with our national or our state coalitions to help make sure that some of the actual legal policy can be changed. Any questions thus far? Good. Okay. And law enforcement, is, it, is anybody law enforcement in the audience? I didn't see many law enforcement folks here this week, but um, we have a, I think we have a very good police department in Charlotte. I mean, everybody makes mistakes, but I think that a lot of our education um, is very trauma-informed that our officers are getting. Um, and they keep trying to do better and better at it and make sure that they understand all the different dynamics. Um, I believe our chief of police came out publicly saying HB2 was not something they were going to enforce. Um, he didn't really go into a lot of details as to why, and that, quite frankly, the fact that he came out at all and said that is good. <laughs> we don't need more details. But um, So things like that are really important, and it sends a message to our community. Um, but certainly trying to get an audience of law enforcement or invite them to trainings that you might be doing surrounding this topic area is very helpful, I think. Um, and even if it's just the head of the sex crimes unit or the DV unit, and then they kind of disperse the information, that's, also, that's a really great step. Um, when you may not have had them in your space at all before. So we all, uh, you all have the power, the old power and control wheel. Um, they, we probably know a little bit about the history. It's been around a long time. Um, it was created in the early 80s, um, and it's a wonderful tool. It, there's nothing wrong with it. It just isn't all inclusive, or as inclusive as we need it to be for our clients, right? Um, so I, I handed it out to you just so you can reference it as we're talking, um, but it was definitely based on more of a white feminist model, right? And, and that's what was needed back then, and that's okay, but now we need to evolve it, right? And we need to think a little bit more outside of the wheel, which is why we created this workshop to begin with. Um, and they don't want to make it gender neutral, they don't want to change it or shift it, and that's fine. Um, because it'll serve its purpose for someone. It, it will speak to someone. And, and when we talk about the diversity of our clients, we also need to remember that everybody is gonna respond differently to everything, right? And so if this works for somebody, that's fantastic, but it definitely doesn't work for our trans and our gender nonconforming clients. Um, there's a lot in it that is absolutely not relatable. Um, and so um, I just wanted to kind of put that out there, that there's nothing wrong with the Duluth model. I mean, I learned it in school. I'm sure a lot of us did. We didn't even think about another way to think about it. And now we have to, right? So who wants to play myth versus fact? I, I expect everybody to get 100% in this room. I mean, really. OK. Um, so LGBT services, organizations, and people are safe to go to for support because they are knowledgeable about trans issues. Myth or fact? How many say myth? How many say fact? OK, mostly myth. It's mostly a myth. I think that we may have staff members um, maybe embedded in some of our organizations throughout the country that have a lot of knowledge. Um, and I know that I was usually one of those staff people, but not everybody made the extra effort to go to trainings and do things like that. It wasn't something that was obligatory. It was something that I did because I wanted to, right? And so there's, there's a big difference. And then when I would try to impart the knowledge, because I used to work at places where if you went to a conference like this, you had to share and train your staff. Um, and so you do that like hour, three hour presentation or whatever in 30, 15 minutes maybe, and just the nuts and bolts of it, and then it doesn't sink in, right? So I don't think it's 100% myth, but it certainly is not, um, most of these centers are not necessarily structured um, to serve the clients, right? Yeah, and that's um, true. Like the T has historically been silent in that it's mostly, and even the B, it's, it's mostly been lesbian and gay, and those are the experiences that they've, they've been focused on because that's, that's just where historically it's been. 
Um, so that's, that's getting better in some organizations, but I think we can't assume sending people there because a lot of times it's, a, it's gay and lesbian staff and they've talked about a lot about sexual orientation, but they might not have the education on gender identity. And it's the same thing with like looking at the power and control wheel because they have the model that's the LGBT model, but it's missing a lot of the things that trans people experience. It's, it's still mostly based on sexual orientation. All right, so the next one. Power and control look the same in heterosexual, cisgender, LGBTQ, and trans relationships. Myth or fact? Myth? How many say myth? Good job. Good thing I brought prizes for you in the back. Look at that. <laughs> yes, myth. And we're going to hand out our reconstructed um, chart. It's not a wheel. We, we completely redid it and took the wheel out um, in a few moments so that you can also see um, and compare the differences for yourself. Most issues faced by trans people are a direct result of their being transgender, myth or fact. How many say myth? How many think fact? Or maybe we should do true or false, does that sound better? So, when we do this question in particular, it, it kind of stumps people a little bit, right? Because it, that their identity, a lot of the argument that I always hear is, well, if you dress that way, you might get that attention, which is the same age-old argument that we always say about survivors, no matter who you are, right? Well, if you appear this way, then you might be asking for that, right? Or if you, if you talk this way or act this way in public, this is what could happen. And, um, but in reality, this is who they are. And being who you are and loving who you are won't cause you to have harm, shouldn't cause you to have harm, right? It's 100% the responsibility of the people doing those bad things um, to either stop or start, right? Yeah, and beyond that, I think we can't make assumptions when people come in. A lot of times when we have a client come in that's trans, they might come in experiencing depression or, or whatever it's going on in their life, and you're like, oh, well, it must be because of what they're going through as a trans person. Well, we don't know that. Like, it, you have to, this is a human being, and they have all the same complex issues as everybody else, so we can't automatically say when somebody comes in, they're having all these problems because they're trans. They may have a very supportive family. They may have a very positive experience of being trans. So it's just always listening to that person and kind of hearing what their story is and what, what they're going through and what they need from you. Trans people often put themselves in dangerous situations such as participation in sex work, which increases their vulnerability to abuse and violence. Myth or fact? Myth. Yeah, that's, that's the key, right? And this is a good training moment. And when, I, when we do this with our students, this is a really huge teachable moment because most of the time I hear fact. Um, because behavior is always related to a consequence. Especially, I mean, even with, with any of our sexual assault survivors, don't we always hear that? How much, why was she drinking like that? Why was he doing that? Why were they there? What, why'd you go out? What, all, there's always those questions that come up, right? The reality is that we know that there's an enormous homeless population who identify as trans or on the spectrum. And sometimes they're couch surfing. Sometimes they're paying for their groceries by doing sex work. It happens. It's not everyone, and it's not always. And that's the key, right? And, and, it's, and like she said, it's not this, the put themselves. Because when you're talking about somebody that was potentially homeless at 13 and, and has no other options, and when we don't have employment protections in most places, and even if we do have them, then the employer can really say whatever they want. You have people that call, that call and they have a very good phone interview, and as soon as they show up and they see that they're trans, they're like, oh, and then they just never get a call back. And they can say it's for any reason. They don't have to claim that it's discrimination. They have no way to prove that. And how do we define sex work? I might think of it differently than you do. Maybe this is a relationship they feel like they might be in, which is one of the reasons why we also wanted to look at this, because when there is no place to go and you have no housing and you feel like you have no other options, you might stay in this relationship that's very unhealthy for much, much longer than I might judge you to stay in it, right, or think you should. But that might really be your only option, and that's what we see a lot. Okay, so I'm going to hand out the wheel, the, our new wheel for you guys to look at, and then we'll look at some of these scenarios um, and talk about them in our, in our little groups that you were in before, okay?
Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A dot O-R-G.